Welcome back. Now you're at Foundations Enterprise DevOps, standardizing data for producers and consumers. My name is Dennis. Let's go ahead and get started. Our learning objectives for today include knowing when to utilize relational as opposed to unstructured data or even NoSQL data. You also want to be able to connect different services together using different REST APIs and also be able to create data flow diagrams as part of your day-to-day -day operations and being a developer. So data ingestion. What do we mean by that? Well, we really mean, what do you do with your process data? You process the data using functions or other mechanisms, but you have to input something in there. Up until now, you've been utilizing standard data from standard inputs, such as user data, as well as data from uh, the static code and uh, hard, hard coding it via variables. You also have data inputs from flat files as well. But we really didn't talk about the structure of that data and how you should compose it making it available and cross-compatible for different services. So let's visit data flow diagrams once more. Now remember that data flow diagrams include three entities. The external entity that is actually performing actions against the data, the processes, as well as the data stores themselves. Now data stores can mean uh, a database, a flat file, anywhere where data is stored at rest, not necessarily in flight. Now we also want to help infer what data structure is needed by utilizing these processes and understanding what the process and data flow looks like. This will help us understand how we should shape the data and what needs to be standardized going in as well as going out. So let's take an example right here. We have our customer right here, which is our external entity. And let's say they want to actually perform a, uh, a print statement right here. Notice that the change of the diagram right there with the function right there. You also have uh, the transaction table right here, which could be a data store. All this together, it helps you understand. So what are the components that we have? Well, we have a customer making an action on it. So we know that there's gonna be a transaction via our transaction uh, table right here. We also might have a, a customer table. We have a lot of relations between them, right? There's nothing that's actually distinct and, and off. Like they're not cutting off different flows between each other. They're actually uh, connected together via different processes and different flows, such as shipping goods, um, actually refilling inventory. So these are all interrelational processes. Now, understanding that there's interrelational processes that could give us a hint that we need relationship-based data structures. Now, that's not always the case, but that could be the case in this, in this particular example. Let's continue forward. So, relational tables. So this is an example of creating a relational database roughly based on the example that we saw earlier. We have customer invoicing, receipts, transaction related items. And notice that each one has a primary key, a foreign key, and of course their schema fields accordingly. Remember with schema-based relational tables that you need to define that schema. You need to define the table, the fields that go in it, and what type of field, uh, data that goes into those fields all ahead of time. They're not really flexible, but if you plan it out ahead of time, you can actually get some really high performance uh, relational reporting and other transactional items that have to be uh, consistently read. So again, based on previous data flow diagrams, because there was always relation. And in this case, SQL-based relational database needs could be the fit for you. Remember, they're transactional and row-based focus. Right? Row-based focus meaning that these are all columns that you see here. Right? Each one of these is a column. And actually, each one, uh, and we're concerned with the rows, the transactions that go within each row that has a column. They must be structured together accordingly. And when you do use joins, they have to have the same amount of columns on each side because essentially, when you're querying data, you're querying in two dimensions, right? Your columns right here and your rows right here. So everything's a large square. So you actually have to have, when you join another column right here, you have to have the same, uh, the, the amount of data that it has to be relations here from your keys. Now, with SQL technology, you have database management systems. Now, the database management system, DBMS, really is an operating system for your database structure. Now, as mentioned before, we have relational databases. We also have hierarchies, uh, flat files, ones that you're accustomed to today. We also have object-based database stores. And ultimately, how it gets stored, how it gets interacted with other services, and the maintenance and cleanup and indexing, all that together make it DBMS or database management system. So again, remember it's an OS, essentially OS-based 
uh, structures or actions against the database instance itself. You, know, you can have multiple databases within a DBMS, as well as a management system. Here's a relational solution example, just to give you a little bit more clarity. Right? Let's say we have a customer ID. We have a customer ID of one, two, and three, which are a unique primary key. And because it's so unique, it makes a lot of sense to actually make that the key. The domains or a customer name could be multiple subsidiaries, so that may not be a good qualifier for a primary key. We have a status, which is usually active or inactive, so true or false in some, some cases, so that's not a good primary key uh, initiative. So in each row, it's a tuple. Right? Each row is a tuple, so that's a tuple, that's a tuple. A column is also called an attribute, especially when you're naming something in DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL-based uh, solution for, from Amazon Web Services, you call them attributes. And the table itself is also called a relation. So how do you relate one to the other? Remember we talked about primary key. So this would be my primary key. This would be my uh, foreign key based on customer ID. Right? In fact, I'm going to erase that because I don't want to put that there to confuse you. So my primary key is always to the left, the leftmost index. My foreign key could be somewhere else. So that could be my foreign key, my primary key, and this table or this relation is invoice number because it's unique. The customer ID may not be unique for each invoice. Okay. Now, opposite to that, there's no SQL solution examples. And although it looks like a table here, think about this. There's single row partitions. The keyword here is partitions. Now, everything is based on key value attributes. What does that mean? Well, only attribute, just like we saw earlier, think about this. A column is an attribute, okay? Let's go back. These are all attributes, right? You can have one or more, and actually you can add them, right? You can add more or remove them as the schema is flexible, right? Remember, no SQL solution means flexible schemas. Each attribute can have a value, and so you might have for each, uh, each partition right here, right? You might have uh, a set of customers that um, have a unique enough set of key value attributes. And they have their accordingly attributes right here. There's my key, there's my value. And that's a terrible K, but um, you can see that K and then V. Key value pairs right there. And you have multiple key value pairs as column-based attributes. Your roles are considered partitions. That's okay if you don't understand it for now. You'll get more in depth with it in your lab, as well as the DynamoDB uh, lecture series as, uh, further on in this course. Just as a last reminder, there are other NoSQL examples besides column-based family that we saw earlier, aka partitions. There's document-based, graph-based, and of course there's purely key value based. Think back to Python. What will we using with key values? What is the data structure called? That's right, it's called dictionary. Now there's another one called a data structure called JavaScript object notation, which used the same key value pairs. Now you could say, hey, isn't that a document as well? Well, it's an, a series of attributes. A document could be a natural file-based object. It could be a whole XML. The idea that, that key value pairs in, the, in a Python-based dictionary is uh, KV. Remember you have an open bracket, K1, value one, K2, value two, put the comma in between, and then you have the close bracket. Now, we'll do some more practice with Amazon Web Services Console to help you get that notation down. Finally, we have unstructured solutions. So this is an example of Splunk. Splunk is a huge industry standard for data or big data large ingestion. Some people use it for data storage, data lakes, data indexing, and sometimes data warehousing. Ultimately, it can ingest multiple different types of structured and unstructured data, which makes it extremely powerful. You can, you can search based on unstructured data and then ultimately create key value field extractions based on regular expressions. Now, don't worry, this class is not all about testing you on, well, what am I going to do with unstructured data? Remember earlier in different sections of this course that we use regular expressions to extract semi-unstructured data, as long as you understood what the pattern had, or if there was a distinctive pattern as a sub-search within your data. That's what Splunk does, and that's how the key value pair works when you're actually searching different data, especially unstructured data. And there's another one called 
uh, natural language processing. And it's another way to say, well, the US English language is actually a structure-based language. It has tokenization. So when you think NLP, think tokenization. Okay. And so a bunch of different algorithms, operations, and not within the scope of this course, but combined with AI and many of the principles and practices that we have with modern technology, actually can actually tokenize and understand the structure of an English sentence. Just like we would as a human knowing this language, and we already know this based on practice and the connections in our head, creating those tokenizations for us, understanding what a noun is, a pronoun, a verb, and an adjective, it's a lot harder to program a computer for. The stop words and many different other things, just remember that even though there could be a sentence and it could be devised as a string, it can actually be a tokenized way of structuring data depending on your solution. Now, that was a lot of information. I want you to go back, think about what we just talked about and how to actually apply it. Let's take a short break. And we'll see you back in a second. All right, welcome back. I hope you have a great break. Let's go to section two, data processing and the output. So you have an understanding of what should go in structured, semi-structured, or even unstructured. What do we do with output? How do we process that? And what should we make our output? Should it be the same one as going in and coming out? Preferably in most cases, but not always the case. So we have direct integration when you're processing data, right? So API to API, when you think of Direct integration, think of API to API. Now, the state is not kept anywhere. The APIs are responsible for keeping that state between them, right? It relies on a mature stack. So you have to trust the API ingesting, you have to trust the API um, processing and consuming. So what is a good example of a mature API? Well, well-documented, uh, popularized in some, some ways. And the services must tolerate scaling up and scaling down based on your performance requirements. API 1, which is a producer, API 2 may have different uh, creation and ingesting requirements over time. Each of these should scale independently of each other, and there may be some bidirectional communication. In this case, we only have unidirectional communication from the producer to the consumer. I've created a very basic function here. I want to return a float value of input 1 plus input 2. I want to create a consumer of that float and append it to a list. Every time I run uh, the consumer function and grab something from the float as a producer, then I'm going to add that to my list. Now I can finally print my list. And what, here, what we see here with my input 3 plus 10, you have uh, that as my first element. So to access that, I would say my list. And that is going to give me the uh, integer in this case, uh, oh, I say the double, uh, the float of this case of 10, uh, 13. Well, I may eat, drink some more coffee. Anyways, the point is direct integration is made possible by very mature APIs, and you should keep that in consideration. Notice that I have a, a float, and then it's going to be output still as a float back into a list. And in this case, this will be my data structure, the data store. I can always change it or manipulate it, but it really depends on my use case and my applications such as XML to JSON, or HTML to JSON, or even unstructured data, all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Now, another thing about processing data is that caching and caching strategies are really important for developers, and especially when you become a senior developer and get closer to your career um, as a principal, you need caching strategies to have high performance and scaling based applications. Now, there's two main ones that uh, is covered in AWS, especially at the developer associate level. There's lazy loading and there's TTL expiration. And these are the two favorite ones that I personally use as well. Remember, the key points is that caching is a low latency temporary source, often in memory, but sometimes on disk as well. What are some examples of caching? Well, let's say you've looked at a web URL. If you go to CNN.com, FoxNews.com, for whatever reason, you might see CDNs. Uh, or things in the URL, say it's CDN or caching, or even Akamai, Cloudflare, and many other caching, uh, Fastly, or many other caching networks. Those are caching uh, objects that don't change too frequently, such as the logo, 
um, or background colors and other CSS schemas that don't change as often as the actual news stories themselves. Those items are cached so you have a better loading experience, mobile and on the desktop. Some use cases also include keeping state. So if I'm buying something from a shopping cart from a website and I lose connectivity and the server is keeping my uh, session state but not anywhere else, well, I've just lost my shopping cart. If, it, if that's happened to you, it's chances are they're not using a caching layer somewhere else in between the shopping cart and your actual uh, uh, client session. Now remember in the lazy loading schema, you're gonna get a cache hit or you can get a cache miss. In lazy loading, we also say that a cache hit means that we're gonna uh, have something that's already in my caching area, an object. I'm just gonna, I'm not sure what to draw here, but I'm gonna say uh, I wanted to cache hit uh, the string A, B, C for some reason. All right, if that's already my cache, I'm gonna pull up from cache instead of doing memory. Now for every cache miss, let's say I don't have the memory, and let's say I am looking for A, B, C, the client, and lazy loading the client portion of the application is responsible for going into the database, pulling it in uh, to themselves, right? And then loading it, right? Loading A, B, C back in the cache, hence lazy loading, all right? Now, the great thing about that is, is that you only load what you don't have in uh, the cache and you can actually benefit the next person that accesses that uh, object. However, you're also making, you're also being double penalized right here, sometimes triple penalized, depending on who you ask, uh, of not finding the data fast enough. So the first person that uh, is missing that will have to load it themselves. The other thing is you might come across uh, still objects eventually. Let's say you make changes to ABC and it becomes ABCD. Well, ABCD is not part of that object, so it has to be loaded again. Eventually, it might fill up. You may want to have a TTL expiration or time to live value, so, say for five minutes. If you want it for five minutes, then you can also go ahead and that will uh, deplete itself in cache and memory and go ahead and the lazy loading will happen again. Now you have to find the right balance between your data types, how often they're accessed, and when you should utilize lazy loading plus a time to live together. Five minutes may be too long for your application, or 10 minutes may be a better use instead of five minutes because it might be too short. Again, depending on your use case applications, keep this in mind as you're creating and utilizing different caches, such as the Amazon Elastic Cache, uh, Memcached or Redis solution. We talked about a little bit about databases. Now remember, databases are long-term storage needs, uh, usually on disk, sometimes in memory like a Redis. Uh, but the important thing is it keeps application and transactional state. So especially with SQL-based databases, you're saying, hey, if I create an order and I have an invoice, there is the actual state. Is the invoice paid, yes or no? That's a status. If the invoice is paid, then go ahead and proceed with the order. That becomes a purchase order and then your uh, accounts receivable will have received that uh, item, the purchase order is cut, and then finally your order is delivered to you based on your payment capability. You can combine this with caching along with the long-term storage database needs to get the best performance out of them. Remember, databases, long-term storage solution. Now, database to database sometimes also happens. So you're not necessarily having an API that goes into a database into another API that goes into another database. Sometimes, depending on your database management system, you have connectors between two different database types, having that functionality, but sometimes you might have to have uh, different structures or schemas. Take, for instance, MongoDB and JSON format. Notice that the open brackets, the different key value pairs, along with the actual commas until the very last one. Now, that's MongoDB's compatible format. And then with Amazon DynamoDB, that may not be enough. Maybe to make a transaction um, more capable or you need to actually translate it into a way that uh, DynamoDB and other Amazon Web Services can parse, you might need to include additional details, additional context, attributes, right? Attributes are the key, the value, right? Key value pairs. Now, I mentioned data house versus uh, data warehouse versus data lake. There are some distinct differences. At the time of this recording, data lakes are less mature than data warehouses because it's, warehouses have been around longer. Take, for instance, a data warehouse such as NetWitness, which is an RSA product that creates and stores 
uh, packet capture data, as well as logging data. That is a data warehouse because it has to have structural uh, and transactional based applications to do the reporting. A data lake, however, is anomalational and usually uh, allowing for unstructured data and heterogeneous uh, data structure types. Now here are the differences between the two. Pause the video, as I won't read them all out loud to you, but I'll notice some key points in understanding where you should use one or the other in most cases. Again, pause the video, read through this, and let's go back to understanding and analyzing what we just read. All right, hopefully you've gotten through and read through this. Data warehouse, remember, is transactional, relational in most cases. All right? Data lake means non-relational. So think of NoSQL in that case. The schemas are implemented on write. So basically, you have to pre-process the data and understand it. And then you have to define the schema when you write it. Uh, now, on the data lake, you define what you want to analyze and how, such as Amazon S3 using Athena. You have to understand that the data is there, and then you have to piece it together, and that's your schema. A schema is just a model of how you want your data to look like when you query against it. Now, warehouses mean pre-processing your data up front. Again, schema on write versus schema on read. Your price to performance, well, varies depending on the warehouse versus the data lake. Your data quality. I mean, warehouses require and have a very low uh, ability to be flexible with the data. You must have really good data going in. Uh, otherwise, we uh, wouldn't have a term garbage in, garbage out. Data lake, however, may not be curated. It can have a lot of heterogeneous data that has to be indexed and, and really analyzed against. You use each one. Well, a lot of BAs or business analysts, anyone that does reporting, uh, Tableau, uh, Power BI, any kind of visualizations must have usually structured data. And for that, data warehouses make a lot of sense. Uh, Click View could be also another application. Data lakes are usually by done by scientific reasons and as well as the um, academic research because you're going to be drawing upon different insights and data, data structures and types, and you may not have all the time in the world to conclude different things from it based on heterogeneous sources, right? Their research has to be in abundance, so to draw conclusions from it, you have to be able to uh, search against many different structures. Finally, from the analytics standpoint, remember visualizations and BI, so business intelligence, batching, Again, the use cases differ, but again, remember that we have the users and the analytics usually grouped together, such as machine learning and other predictive analytics based on heterogeneous based data. All right, let's take a break and then we'll come back and do a very quick demo uh, based on some of the concepts that we've done. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a great break. Let's go ahead and zoom in just a little bit more so you can see it. It's a little too far. I'll zoom back. Notice that I've created key one, value one, and for proper JSON format, you have to have uh, quotations. You don't necessarily have to have this in, in Python. Notice that the if I take away a, a quotation or use single quotes instead, it's not going to be compliant. If I validate this, it's saying there's an error. So remember that anything with JSON and JavaScript, JavaScript object notation, I have to have double quotes. I can beautify it. Validate and turn it into some like XML, but other storage solutions, including uh, comma separated values, which also could be interesting. Go ahead and take that. Now I have my attributes, my value. So when you think of partitions or NoSQL with column based partitioning, think of CSV. So if you have JSON, turn it into a CSV, and you can actually more easily potentially. Uh, ingest and process things from a NoSQL column-based partition. Let's go to our AWS console. Let's take a look at the SQL relations and what makes them so. So far, we've used different uh, NoSQL-based uh, DynamoDB in your actual labs. I have a table with uh, elastic load balancer logs. This is Athena, which allows me to use SQL-based relational queries against uh, structures such as S3 and other base items, including my other JSON-based logs, and give, allow me to use SQL as a data warehouse. Now I'm going to select all from my table right here, and my fields or my attributes are right here. 
I'll limit it to the first five. I'll run that. And here is my stuff, my my attribute, my value, and of course, uh, for whoever is thinking about partitioning from no SQL standpoint, this will be my uh, partition keys. From a relational database perspective, and the great thing about Athena is that you can actually take this uh, partition-based unstructured data and then turn it into something uh, that you want, right? Uh, remember that you have uh, schema on read sometimes, but you can also use this for schema on write. So it actually makes this for an interesting solution for both use cases. Notice I have my tuples right here, and I can export that to anything else I want. I've made it two-dimensional, so I could potentially make something that's uh, not as structured into a more structured format based on uh, logs and JSON and things of that nature. Athena can help me glue that together. Now you can actually play with this. You get charged by uh, each query and how much data you uh, ingest, such as mine. I have um, a query that ran from one second plus uh, 8.4 megs utilized. If you want to learn more about the Athena process, you can always go to help. And there's also the tutorials right here, which gives you a sample set of different um, queries that you're looking for. Let's also go to DynamoDB for a second. We'll create a new table temporarily, a little test. I'll create my partition key to be um, some key. We'll let it be a string, or it could be a binary number. Sort key is optional, and I'll use the defaults. Here's my table, and if I go to my table here, view items, same as running a scan, here's my table. I can create a new item. And again, my attribute name key could be something else. So uh, could be a customer, customer Dennis, right? Now I'll use Dennis Chow, because maybe that is a little bit more unique. I want, maybe I want to have how old I am. So my age based on my attribute would be 36. Kind of old. I'll create a new item. Again, we can keep adding new attributes. I can define it on write, right? Which makes this a highly qualified solution to be a potential helper of data lake uh, solution as opposed to a data warehouse solution. So if I return that again, some key and my age. The best part about this is I can edit this. I can edit my item and add to my schema, which is really. Uh, a really cool thing. I can have a list and say my list, and I can have new values, such as another string. String one, a number, such as 10. Now, does this sound familiar from a structure standpoint? It should, right? It should be something, such as a boolean instead, a true and a false. I'll remove this. Now, does this look really familiar to you? Oh yeah, a list can have a bunch of different mixed objects, just like Python, and my attribute or my key, inside DynamoDB at least, unlike Python, can have more, uh, one value, which is my list, containing subsets of values, and that can be searched again too. So, as you can see here, I'm defining my schema on write, I'm uh, sorry, schema on uh, read. So I can define, manipulate this data, save changes, and if I wanted to scan the entire data, well, we have all this together. Really cool stuff. I can also use it for uh, schema on write uh, as if I was doing that, but really no SQL options are really good for data lakes. All right, click on view table details, and you can also get a lot of different details about my index, monitoring information, of course, we're not going to have much together as I've only done a couple of queries uh, and my reuse is over there. Okay, that's it for now. Go ahead and head to your lab. We'll see you in the next lecture.